and Issues, a monthly business forum bringing timely economic discussion to the region for 35 years. Presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Thank you to our 2019-2020 sponsors and partners. Presenting sponsors, Bank of America and Martins Point Healthcare. Cooperating sponsors, First Light, WEX, and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Community Corner sponsor, Coral Palmer. Parking sponsor, CB and Mahar Engineers. Reception sponsors, Clark Insurance, KeyBank, and Verrill. Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs sponsors, Springborn Staffing Center and AAA North New England. Media partners, News Radio WGAN, The Forecaster, WMTW News 8, Maine Biz, with production support provided by Headlight. And thank you to our 2019 20 special community partners Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, Spectrum Healthcare Partners, the University of Southern Maine, and Southern Maine Community College. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber President, Jim Cohen. Good morning and welcome to Eggs and Issues, the monthly business breakfast of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. My name is Jim Cohen. I'm a partner with the law firm Verrill Dana, and I'm honored to serve as the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber Board of Directors. Today's Eggs and Issues is a first. For nearly 40 years, our event has been held live with hundreds of people, lots of coffee, and a full breakfast. This month, in line with important directions to stay home and stay safe due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are pleased to bring you our first ever virtual Eggs and Issues, live from my living room in the North Deering neighborhood of Portland and live from the home offices of our distinguished group of panelists. I'd hope to have with me this morning a live studio audience, but as you can see, that plan failed to materialize as many of you with college students now living at home understand, rarely do they see this side of 10 a.m. I do, however, want to thank all of you for joining us today and for joining us at a safe distance. Today's audience is a record crowd given the importance of today's topic and the significance of our guests. Although today's program is virtual, uh, we encourage you to enjoy our own, uh, our own, uh, our own breakfast opportunity together. And if you're feeling nostalgic about breakfast at the Holiday Inn, we would further encourage you to partake in your own plate of Fiesta scrambled eggs or a breakfast burrito. Also on the menu during this time of social distancing, life cereal, which speaks for itself. On a serious note, although today's event is remote, the topic hits home for all of us. Months ago, as we followed the progress of the coronavirus abroad, few of us could foresee that the virus would eventually land on our shore, in our state, in our neighborhood, and force us to stay home and limit contact with other people. We didn't foresee, although in hindsight, perhaps we should have, that so many businesses would need to close their doors temporarily or permanently, and thousands of Mainers would be out of work. However, as we enter April, terms like social distancing, flattening the curve, N95 masks, and the Paycheck Protection Program have become part of our everyday lexicon. Today, we are honored to have with us three amazing guests who are on the front lines of keeping us informed about these emerging issues and keeping us safe. Today's program will start with a presentation from Dr. Narav Shah, Director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We see Dr. Shaw on the news every day, and he is doing a fantastic job advising us about how Maine is dealing with the coronavirus and how we can all stay safe. Dr. Shaw will give us a brief presentation regarding the medical and health aspects of the pandemic to be followed by a brief Q&A. Then Dr. Shaw has to sign off to attend to other important work. Next up will be Heather Johnson, Commissioner of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development. Commissioner Johnson has been working tirelessly with businesses and other groups for weeks, letting them know about state and federal programs to help them weather the coronavirus storm. Commissioner Johnson will discuss some of these important programs for employers and their employees. Also joining us is Dr. Dora Ann Mills, Chief Health Improvement Officer at Maine Health and former director of the Maine CDC under both Governor Kang and Governor Baldacci. Dr. Mills will be on hand to answer health-related questions about the virus 
after Dr. Shah has to depart. A sincere welcome to all of our guests. We know how busy they are and we truly appreciate the important work they're doing. However, before we start our program, some housekeeping details. We obviously don't have mics set up on the floor today, but you can submit questions through, through the chat function on your YouTube screen by logging into Google and YouTube. After Commissioner Johnson's presentation, we will provide an opportunity for audience members to submit questions for Commissioner Johnson and Dr. Mills. And then we will wrap up promptly at 9 a.m. so that you can get on with your day at home if you are like me. So with that, let me turn to Maine CDC Director, Dr. Shaw, and ask him to provide a brief update on the coronavirus in Maine and what we can expect over the coming weeks and months. Dr. Shaw. Great, thank you so much, Jim, and good morning, everyone. I very much appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to join you all virtually today. Uh, let, me, let me first start out by thanking everybody who has joined today for two specific things. The first is accommodating, as Jim mentioned, this somewhat new format that each of us is getting used to in the world. Uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting, just almost as a sociological note, uh, about the ways in which we are engaging in this wild experiment in tele-everything, whether that is teleconferencing, tele-education, telehealth, or in this case, tele-eggs and issues. And so I thank everyone for accommodating this different format. But given the audience today, I'd also like to thank you for your resilience within the business community in working with us as we ourselves have grappled with the coronavirus, fully recognizing that many of the public health recommendations that we have made have had significant implications for your businesses. And I'd like to just take a moment personally to acknowledge what you have sacrificed and thank you for your willingness to cooperate with us as a result of that. Uh, I'd like to just provide a quick overview of where things stand uh, and then try to uh, provide a bit of a glimpse into what we've done so far and then, to the extent I can, try to give a flavor for what the next several weeks might entail. Um, as of this morning, there are now over 500 cases of coronavirus across the state. And we've detected cases of the virus in all but one county in the state, all but Piscataquis County. Moreover, we've also, uh, we've also determined that the virus has been transmitting in at least two states on what is known as a community level. That is to say, it's freely going from person to person, even though those folks have not had contact with other known cases or with any type of travel. That is to say, the risk of coronavirus has squarely arrived here in Maine. And unfortunately, we anticipate that the number of cases, as well as the geographic distribution of cases, will continue to increase over the coming days and into probably in the coming weeks. Sadly, we've also had a number of fatalities across the state. Uh, as there now have been almost 13,000 deaths in the United States, we've had now 12 fatalities here in Maine, both of which are, of course, quite sad, uh, and all of which are, and we extend our condolences uh, to everyone and, and all the families who are grieving those losses right now. One of the challenges with any type of novel virus is that in the situation we are in right now, there is not yet any type of vaccine or really any type of well-defined or studied treatment. And as a result of that, the best tool that we in the public health community have is to introduce as much physical distance, although a lot of people refer to it as social distance, I like to think of it as physical distance, is to try to introduce as much physical distance between one person and the next to, in, in order to disrupt the natural flow of the virus. The virus jumps from person to person through spreading in droplets, most usually. And those are droplets that can be spread when someone coughs or sneezes. And by introducing this physical distance between one person and another, we can try to disrupt that flow, that transmission, that we know can generate so many cases. Unfortunately, in a vibrant economy, physical distancing is one of the things that can bring that economy almost to a screeching halt as we've seen around the world. 
again, I fully recognize the impact that these public health implicate the public health interventions and recommendations have had on each and every one of your businesses. And I want to take a moment to thank you for going along with them. Across the world, as recommendations of these sort were being implemented or recommended, there were concerns about whether it was too much. And one of the things that I have personally observed working on outbreak type situations for about 19, almost 20 years now, is that everything you do before the peak of an outbreak hits is considered to be an overreaction. And then that everything you do after the peak of that outbreak hits is considered to be too late or inadequate. Uh, so to put it differently, if after all of this is over, there are those who wonder whether we did too much, well, that's probably a pretty good sign that we did just about the right things. I say that because the virus itself is completely different than many of the other viruses that we've contended with in recent years. It spreads more easily than seasonal influenza, which itself spreads quite easily from person to person. It's also quite medically serious. A high number of people who get the virus need to be admitted to the hospital, and a high fraction of those folks need to be in intensive care, as, for example, we're seeing with Prime Minister Johnson right now. And a high number of those folks who are in intensive care need to be put on a ventilator, a breathing machine. And sadly, a higher number of those folks actually pass away. So just from a purely medical standpoint, this is a serious virus. Added on top of all of that is the fact that unlike a lot of viruses, quite literally no one has any natural immunity to this virus whatsoever. We are all uniquely susceptible, partly because the world has never seen this virus and also because there is no vaccine. Coming as this virus does, close to the peak of the flu season, the healthcare system was already strained. When you add on top of that additional individuals who need critical care or ventilators, it presents a distinct challenge to the system. And that is why these physical distancing measures, many of which again have entailed closure of non-essential businesses and severely curtailed operations at even essential businesses, that is, the, that is why they are so essential right now. Um, it's a situation where because the playbook involves a virus that we haven't seen and one that we know is virulent, the best thing that we can do in the long term is try to put a stop to the virus as much as we can right now in the short term, recognizing the challenge, the disruption that that causes. So I, again, I want to thank you for all of your cooperation from the business community as we've made these recommendations. Now, the one thing I know that is on everything, everyone's mind is what is this going to look like and when is it going to come to an end? And there has, of course, been speculation on that front by folks at the federal level. I'm not going to speculate on that today. I, the simple answer is science will dictate when the virus and when these types of public health interventions uh, need, can be lifted. In the same way that we arrived at them in stepwise fashion, layering one on top of the other as the scientific situation changed, we will likely remove them in similar stepwise fashion once we see signs and signals of safety on the horizon. I don't know when that will be. And so again, I, I, will, I will say what, for someone who is involved in science and someone who is involved in government, are probably the three hardest words to say, which are, I don't know when many of these public health recommendations and interventions might be lifted. But what I can tell you is that the team at Maine CDC, as well as the team at the US CDC, are looking at the data on an almost multi, multiple times per day basis to get a sense of how things are changing and thinking about what types of signs we would want to look for in order to start removing some of these public health interventions in the same way that we layered them on top of one another like an onion, we will probably peel them back in the same way. When that starts, what that looks like and the order in which we do so 
it's premature to speculate, but I do want to assure you that this is very much on the top of everyone's mind, and we are being very thoughtful in the way we're trying to balance extinguishing the outbreak with the need to try to resume normalcy in our lives as quickly as we can. So with that, I will pause, uh, and Jim, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have or that uh, everyone joining us today might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. And again, we really appreciate the, the work of you, your entire team, uh, as we navigate uh, really these uncharted territories. So one question that uh, we've certainly heard from, from many people is, uh, I think you said that uh, it's not clear when the stay-at-home guidelines will, will be relaxed, but they'll kind of roll, roll back. If, if and when that happens, and we're certainly very hopeful that it does, do you anticipate or what sort of guidance would you give to individuals and businesses from a clinical standpoint as they start to reemerge and have contact once again with other people? Sure. So, Jim, I, I want to say at the outset, things will get better. Um, it, it is not a question of, of if, it is a question of when. Uh, what we know about viruses is that they can be extinguished and these intense, aggressive physical distancing measures are starting to show signs in other parts of the world of doing that curve flattening. But what the world looks like when we start resuming normal commercial activity may in some cases be a bit different. For example, the cloth masking or the cloth face covering recommendations that the US CDC issued on Friday might need to be carried over for a, 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 for a longer period of time, even within business establishments. It's even conceivable that individuals who work in retail and business establishments might wear face covers or even face masks themselves for a period of time. What I will tell you is that my team at the Maine CDC, Dr. Mills's team at Maine Health, our colleagues at the US CDC, will try to base all of these decisions on as much science as we can, as, as opposed to speculation. But it is conceivable that for a period of time, even after we return or begin to return to normalcy, things will be different, even though they might be inching towards normalcy. And Jim, I think you're muted. There we go. So in my household and perhaps in many households, uh, the discussion of what a mask is, what it's used for, how it helps us, and how it doesn't help us has come up and there's been confusion about that. Could you talk a little bit more about how the mask helps, what we can expect from masks, and what we might not expect from masks? Sure thing. This is a question that, that comes up quite a bit and I'm happy to be able to discuss it. Let's start by talking about what we're talking about when we talk about masks. There are masks, which are the medical grade types of pieces of equipment that you see doctors on TV wearing. And that's, um, those are really things that should be reserved just for healthcare providers, partly because wearing them requires special training and taking them off and putting them on so you don't infect yourself, but also because there's a shortage of those pieces of equipment. But then there's also face coverings, which is what the US CDC released some guidance about. And that's really a, a, piece of, a piece of cloth or fabric that can be put over your face. There's a great video with the Surgeon General on how to make your own. And that can be made from a piece of spare cotton or cloth. And the purpose of those is different. The purpose of those medical masks is to prevent the medical person from inhaling the virus. The purpose of those cloth face coverings is to prevent you, if you have the virus, from spreading it to anybody else. So they have different purposes, but in concert with one another, what they, do, they can again do is reinforce this disruption of the natural flow or transmission. Those face coverings are really, according to the CDC, something that should be worn if you're going somewhere where physical distancing isn't possible. So if you have to make that occasional trip to the grocery store, which of course everyone has to do, that would be a good time to wear one of those cloth face coverings for the time being. Great, thank you so much. And Dr. Shaw, I know that you have uh, many important uh, uh, pieces of work to engage in for the rest of today. So we really appreciate your taking time to join us this morning. 
with that, uh, we'll now turn the uh, program over to uh, Commissioner Heather Johnson, who's going to talk to us uh, about other aspects of what the state is doing to help keep our economy going, help keep our businesses going, help keep our employees going. Commissioner Great. Johnson, thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Dr. Shaw, for joining us. We know how busy you are this morning. And, and I just want to say really quickly how grateful we are. Um, we are very fortunate as a state to have somebody like Dr. Shaw at the helm of CDC, um, somebody like Commissioner Lambrew leading up the Department of Health and Human Services, and lots of other great public health experts like Dr. Mills to help us work our way through this. Because if you put public health at the crux of the decisions that we're making, we need smart, thoughtful leaders in those spaces, and we are very fortunate as a state to have that. So, um, you know, as we think about the, as we shift kind of from just a public health discussion into maybe an economic discussion, um, this is an interesting time. It's rare, right, that you try to intentionally suppress your economy um, and ask people to stay home and not participate in the economy in the way that we traditionally think of. <clears throat> um, so it's a real change for all of us. And one of the things I want to make sure people are aware of is we are looking structurally at how do we um, contract this economy in a way that allows us to spin it back up as quickly as possible when that time is appropriate. You heard Dr. Shaw talk about potential. There's a potential as we as we get through this to start loosening some of the standards <clears throat> and allowing people to get back to some of the things that they know. And so we are trying to take a really thoughtful approach to say, we need to be really aggressive on the front end. We need to stop the, the spread of the virus. And that is not just the best thing we can do for public health, it's also the best thing we can do for our economy. Because the sooner we can work our way through this virus timeline, the sooner we'll be able to continue to, to look at growing uh, the economy and, and putting it back into place. Uh, as you know, I'm sure you're all familiar, there are lots of business programs out there right now. Uh, we're going to talk just for a few minutes about those so that we can try to demystify some of them. There, there is also, just so people know, a one-page sheet that aggregates the federal resources, the state resources, and any social impact investors in Maine on the DECD website. So if you go to maine.gov forward slash DECD, there is one sheet there, it's a couple of pages, but there's one file there that will kind of walk you through the different programs and give you the highlights. What I would say is most of these programs are run through local financial institutions. So if you um, go to your traditional normal banker, credit union, lending institution, they will be a great partner for you, I think, in this. The, the banks in Maine have done an incredible job um, over a really short period of time, standing up programs that align to the federal, the federal supports and to the state supports. Um, the payroll protection program is the question we get the most of. That is a program that uh, allows for forgivable loans to the extent that you have the same number of full-time equivalents at the end of June that you do as part of your historical run rate. That helps obviously employees stay connected to their employers. It allows structural work to continue to get done in this period of time where people may not have the operating capital to keep people working. So that is probably the most effective program that we have right now, that there is still money in that program, which is one of the questions we get a lot. There's a limited pool of money in that program. So I would encourage you, there's some urgency to reviewing the program, determining whether or not it works for your business. And if it does, contact your local bank as quickly as possible. What I would say is there were some, there is new guidance coming through some of these programs, right? That the federal government and the state government, frankly, have put together programs really quickly, which means at times there needs to be additional guidance that goes with them. Um, and, and that information continues to evolve. But with the payroll protection program now, they are looking to find ways to get capital out in the market even more quickly, which means now it's about five days between kind of approval and money disbursement, financial disbursement. So um, the, that's really great news for businesses. I would say certainly that's a real shift for how capital moves through our banks and lending institutions. So try to be a little bit patient with them as they work their way through this. Um, again, I can't say enough about the main banks. I drove by a local bank that I live near 
And over the weekend, the parking lot was full of bank employees putting in applications for small businesses in Maine, trying to make sure that they got all of the support they need. Um, at last, the last numbers I had were, we had 1,400 applications that had been approved and over $410 million coming in to Maine as part of this program. Um, that was a couple of days ago, those numbers continue to grow. So again, I would say, or we don't recommend programs, but what we do is recommend that you review these programs because there are a lot of them out there that could be helpful. Um, to the extent that that isn't a program that works for, for a particular business, there's also the economic injury disaster loans. Those two are SBA loans and you can get up to $2 million in assistance through that program. Some of that money can be grant money. Um, there are some elements there that you'll just need to work through with the bank on what you can and can't do, uh, but the local banks are prepared for that. And that program also comes with really long-term repayment programs to try to allow people, to, to try to allow for this natural capital infusion um, challenges. And, and I think it's a four month deferment of any payment. So, right, the recognizing that we've got kind of an acute issue now, um, recognize people need capital and then trying to allow for longer term payments. So again, number of business resources there, we won't spend too much time because maybe in the question period, we can try to address people's specific interests. I will say we get a lot of questions about unemployment um, and the, the commissioner of the Department of Labor obviously is the best person for that, but she sent me some talking points. The last public numbers, so the week ending March 28th, we had over 45,000 people file new or initial claims in that week. Um, we'll have new numbers out tomorrow, but we had over a 3,400% increase same time last year uh, for the two previous years. So, I mean, that is just an unprecedented number of people coming into the unemployment system. Uh, you know, I, many of you know, I guess I did eggs and issues might have been five months ago and we were talking about a worker shortage, right? And how are we gonna solve the worker shortage? And now, you know, in a very short period of time, we've gone from a worker shortage to um, a, a unprecedented number of people applying for unemployment. And that's, you know, that's a huge shift for, for, for everyone. And I think everybody's trying to work through that. One of the good things about the unemployment system right now is it doesn't require people to go look for jobs because we want people to be able to stay connected to their existing employers. That will allow you know, a much quicker reconnect for people back into their jobs when, when those jobs are, are available again. So that's an important piece. Um, the, one, the one thing we would ask if, if you are an employer and you are considering layoffs, if you can't, larger layoffs, if you can please contact the rapid response team, they can much more efficiently support your employees into the unemployment system in that mode than if everybody goes in individually. So um, we'll just put that out there as, a, as an option. Um, and then kind of the other, the other question I get a lot is when, when are we gonna spin this economy back up and what are you doing to be ready? Um, and I would say, honestly, it's a little bit early for that. We have spent most of our time so far trying to work closely with Dr. Shaw and his team on what do we need to be doing to keep people safe? And safety is, is the first piece of this work. Um, kind of now we're getting ready to start thinking about, okay, uh, as, we, as we spun this down, we looked at how do you create critical infrastructure that is stable? So even though less than 50% of our childcare slots are open right now, how do we support childcare locations in a way that when it's time and kids go back to school that they can ramp back up and support, right? We know that childcare infrastructure, we were already having challenges with having enough slots. We need to make sure that the childcare providers can turn that, can open those businesses back up when that time comes. So we are working with, I would say, um, folks across the country on what a plan should look like, how we do it. Um, but what I would say for now is, you know, right now, the priority is public health, keeping people safe, keeping people remote. Um, and, and that's where we're at right now. So Jim, with that, usually there are lots of questions. So I wanna make sure we leave plenty of time. Do you wanna open up the questions? That sounds great. And Commissioner Johnson, thank you so much. I, I know from personal experience, you have been working round the clock, whether it's phone calls, emails, 
on on weekends and and you and and so many state employees are just doing a fantastic job during this very difficult time uh, for thank the national and country. So thank you. Uh, we do have some questions. Great. Uh, let me first say uh, you you had mentioned that there's a one page uh, guideline that will help. Uh, businesses and employers navigate some of these programs. I want to let our audience know that that will be linked on the Chamber's website. Right. Uh, the Chamber is, is working to try to keep all of its members informed. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how, uh, how you would uh, advise businesses? There are so many of the programs and you touched on many of them. Uh, I know in my office and, and with the chamber, we get questions like, well, where do I start first? If I start one program, will I disqualify myself for another program? And as you start getting below the surface, there are some more complexities. Do you have any guidance or direction for businesses trying to figure out where do I start first? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, the SBA has done a great job with some resources on their site. There are also a number of partners who are very in the details of these programs and really understand them. The small business development centers uh, are, are one. CEI has got a couple of small business um, groups as well. They are really spending a lot of time in the details of all of these programs and can help navigate. But I would encourage people to talk to their lending partners. They are really at the point of the spear on this one and are, are a great resource. Um, but also look at the programs, right? Some of them will really meet your needs. If payroll protection and keeping your employees paid is the biggest operating challenge that you have right now, there's a clear answer to that. If that doesn't fit your need, then kind of keep working through. But I would say those are that that's the approach that we're we're suggesting people take. Great, very, very helpful. Uh, in today's paper, there was a discussion about uh, how the payroll Paycheck Protection Act helps. Uh, employers principally with with wages and keeping employees employed, um, mm -hmm. but that for businesses where rent becomes a much more significant expense, uh, that the program doesn't provide as much assistance there. Again, any words of direction for those types of businesses? Yeah, so only about 25% of the funding come out, coming out of the payroll protection program can be allocated to things like rent. Um, the, um, the economic injury disaster loan is really a great place to look there. There, is, there are $10,000 grants available as part of that program that can go toward rent. Um, so I think that's a good opportunity. The state, um, one of the, you know, it, when you get into these moments, right, you have the opportunity to see some great things come out of people and and the state legislature really coalesced around resources and support in a very nonpartisan way kind of right before they adjourned and in as part of that omnibus package there was a consumer and sole proprietor loan guarantee program um that is being worked now uh, there are a couple of details that need to be fixed because it happened pretty quickly and there were a couple of misses there that just need to be tightened up that's being worked um, that money also is loan money, but it can go to things like rent and provide kind of that working capital, short-term working capital. Great, thank you so much. And we, and we have uh, Dr. Dora Ann Mills uh, with us also. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mills, for joining us this morning. We certainly uh, remember very well uh, the nearly 16 years you spent as our director of the CDC. So thank you so much. Uh, so let me turn back to a, a health-related question. And, and specifically, I think we saw today that uh, in China, the Wuhan province is essentially getting back to normal, but that one of the important pieces of that happening was testing. To what degree can we look forward to testing and more testing as a way to help get us back to work uh, and able to be around other people again? No, that's a great question. And thank you so much for having me. And it's um, always wonderful to, uh, to see um, Commissioner Johnson and uh, also Dr. Shaw, whom I just adore. He's a good friend and colleague and um, I think we're very fortunate to have him at the helm there. So there are several criteria which 
uh, generally we need to meet in order to start loosening things and loosening the mandates. And one of them is the wide availability of testing. You have to be able to figure out who's got it. And of course, right now, as you know, across the country, there have been these uh, supply chain issues around testing and, and testing supplies specifically. <clears throat> so, so we've been not able to test widely, as widely as we should be able to in an epidemic. Um, that is helping, as you know, our very own Abbott Labs is, uh, is producing one of the, the quick tests, rapid tests. Um, so we hope to get a lot more of those in Maine soon. Um, and I think because the federal government's taken a lot of control over the supply, it's not a matter of just driving to Scarborough and picking it up and delivering around the state. Um, though I do understand Martin's point has a, has, a, has a limited supply of those. So we hope to get a lot more of those. And I know IDEX, um, our own Nordics labs at Maine Health, um, the affiliated labs up in uh, with Northern Light Health, and of course the state lab. There are several labs now who are able to test, not as great as we'd like to, but hopefully be able to expand in the next hopefully in the next days and weeks so that anybody who's got symptoms can um, can be able to get tested. Um, and that's, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that'll happen. And it's gotta happen in order for us to reduce the, the mandates um, for the state and the federal government to reduce mandates. Um, the other thing I should just mention is that um, the hospitals need to be able to take care of obviously everybody who's sick with COVID as well as everyone else. Um, because we have a lot of pent up demand, obviously the non-essential or elective types of procedures that have been postponed. Well, at some point, a lot of those become essential. So there's a backlog. Um, I want to be able to get, be able to have the hospitals be able to open up to that. Um, and also we need to be able to uh, see a sustained reduction in cases um, over at least a couple of weeks period. And we're not there yet. We keep seeing a sustained increase um, in cases, though the really great thing is that the rate of increase seems to be reduce, reducing a little bit. That is the, another way to put it is the doubling time. Um, so the time it takes to double the numbers of cases, it, three weeks ago, it was two days in Maine. It's now, it, you know, it depends on how many days you're gonna average, but it's nine to 11 days, which is astounding, it's great. It's, we still, we need to see a decrease, not a decrease in the rate of increase. So right now we're seeing preliminary signs in that it's a decrease in the rate of increase, which is not the same thing as a decrease. So, um, but it's, it's a good early preliminary sign, just sort of like some of the buds coming out on the trees, I guess, um, that the leaves will be <laughs> forthcoming hopefully soon. So this social distancing, I think there's a, you know, this preliminary evidence that it is working. Um, I know I work at Maine Health at downtown Portland at corporate headquarters and it it's just breaks my heart because you can walk down the middle of Congress Street and not get run over in the middle of the day. And it's, um, it's very sad. So I know that our business community, people out there, when we talk about cases of COVID, we're so um, frequently talking about people with the disease. And yet I just look out my window and I see evidence that there's a lot more than just people who are infected with the disease. We have our business community, a lot of small family businesses that have had to close and, um, and, and I hope that they can reopen too. I understand some of them may not, you know, it may not be able to. So I just want to tip my hat off to the chamber for, and Quincy and you, Jim, for, for really stepping up to the plate to help um, our business community because we know health is not just about physical health. It's also about economic health and mental health and all kinds of other aspects of our health. So um, I'm so sorry for the challenges that our business community is going through. And, um, and I thank the chamber for, for helping out and, and Commissioner Johnson at DECD. Thank you, Dr. Mills. Uh, yes, it has been just an incredibly difficult period of, of time. And I think our hearts go out to all of the businesses uh, all of the employees as we struggle uh, both to stay safe uh, and hopefully to keep our economy going. So I wanted to turn to a question, I think, for both uh, Commissioner Johnson and, and Dr. Mills, and it relates to some unique aspects of, of Maine. And I happened to see in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that there was an estimate of which states might disproportionately be impacted by 
the coronavirus. And Maine uh, turned out was at the very top of that list, presumably because we are the oldest state in the country. We have many, many small businesses. I happen to think we're a very hardy and resilient state. Uh, and so despite some of those statistics, I'm hopeful uh, that it's not an accurate measurement of how Maine will fare. But any comments about uh, that type of a statistic and how Maine might fare relative to other places? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I think how we fare to other places is a relative discussion, right? And we can look at it. I, you know, the the factors that they utilize to make that determination are are accurate, right? We have a lot of small locally family owned businesses and we are older and we are more dispersed. All of those factors weighed into their criteria. Um, and frankly, they're all true and we recognize that. I think people are quick to to agree with that given given some of the challenges we had coming out of the 2008 um, economic slowdown or recession. And, and so I think there were lots of things there to consider. I also think managers are incredibly strong and resilient and want to take care of our own. And so this is a time potentially that we can start thinking differently about not only the businesses we have, but how we support businesses. You know, I was, um, I, I ran into a farmer yesterday and he said, all of a sudden I can't keep meat in stock. And I said, Absolutely right. People now want to know what their food sources are. They want to know where things are coming from. Um, they want to support their local, you know, store owners. They want to try to do some of that work. So I think if we can collectively, as we start to turn this economy back on, think more um, clearly and more specifically about how do we help our local businesses first? How do we take that extra effort? to buy the face coverings from a main manufacturer who is making those as opposed to just going out and getting whatever the first one you can find is, um, you know, those are the things that are gonna help and make make us be more resilient and come back more quickly and prove, and prove the Wall Street Journal and, and some of those reporters wrong in this case. Great. And I would just add to that, that, um, you know, in terms of us being the oldest state in the nation, I mean, it does impact, we have already seen, that um, our hospitalization rate from COVID is higher than the national average, about a third higher preliminarily. And that's not really surprising because what we know from the data in China and preliminary data in this country um, and from Italy, <clears throat> that the older you are, the more likely you are to have to be hospitalized and, um, and have severe outcomes. So um, we have the highest proportion of people 65 and older, 21% um, in Maine compared to 16% um, nationally. And we have the highest median age um, in the country of 45 versus 38 um, in the country. So not surprisingly um, with, uh, with those statistics that our hospitalization rates are also higher. Um, so I think, you know, we are at risk in terms of health-wise uh, being impacted. And that's one reason why we at Maine Health and other health systems in the state have been working very hard to make sure that our seniors are especially what we call cocooning, which is a kind of a euphemism, I think, for isolation. Um, but our long-term care facilities, we've been you know, knock on a lot of wood, we've been fortunate so far not to have, we've had some outbreaks in our long-term care facilities, but not to the extent um, as some other states. As an example, Rhode Island and, and Vermont, <clears throat> over half of their deaths have been from people living in long-term care facilities. So the Maine Healthcare Association, our long-term care facilities, and many others have really stepped up to the plate, our health systems and the state to try to get the word out to um, those facilities early and get them <clears throat> isolated, cocoon. So if you have seniors in living in those places, um, family members, I know it's been really hard, but we're really hoping that this physical isolation does not result completely in social isolation, that we can use new tools, such as what we're using today, to stay in touch with them and try to reduce and you know, mitigate that disproportionate impact that we otherwise might see in Maine. I know I've seen in, in my neighborhood and maybe many others have as well, I've never seen so many people walking, running uh, at all hours of the day because we're home all the time. In fact, I, I feel like I could never leave the office anymore because my office is right behind me. Uh, but we've seen some statistics nationally that 
uh, the rate of exercise has gone down. Could that be a function of urban areas versus uh, rural areas in, in places like Maine, where we are blessed with the ability to go outside and socially distance. Do we have any data or statistics about how people are getting out there? Yeah, I haven't. I don't seen... think we... Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Mo. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I haven't seen speci um, specific statistics yet about the percentage of people who are going out and exercising, but you do see it. I know, Jim, you and I live not too far from each other, and it is amazing to see people, I mean, I get up usually to, I'm watching the sunrise and I'm just see all these people out there um, pretty early in the morning um, for this time of year. So that's been good to see. Um, but of course the social distancing has been a challenge too. So I noticed the back cove parking lots could close yesterday, which I kind of broke my heart, but I, I think, you know, people are too close to together and the beaches and the like, but hopefully over time those can be reopened, but it has been good to see people out and I think that's been a big advantage of being a. It's it's April in Maine. It's not November, and um, and people are living in Maine, and there are it, there is more space in New York City with seventy thousand people per square mile. Really had to you know they it's it's almost impossible for them to do social distancing. You can't get out to get groceries without bumping into people and being within six feet. So we've been very fortunate to be able to <clears throat> implement these measures a lot easier and for people to get out and exercise more, I think, than what they've been able to do in some of our larger urban areas. And by contrast, we have about 43 per square mile. That's 43, not 43,000, versus they have 70,000. So <clears throat> a lot easier to get outside and exercise and to do social distancing. Right. Yeah, Jim, if I could just jump in there too, you know, we have we've encouraged people right to try to go out and and get some exercise and get some fresh air in a way that is careful and responsible um in the same and you know at the same time we have had to close beaches because of people congregating right so this balance of getting outside and recreating but also blocking off this congregation opportunity is a is a balance that continues to evolve as people find different assets and resources that they want to use to recreate I know there's been a lot of concern about golf courses being closed. Um, what we found is, right, of course, golf is a great outdoor activity. Of course, we support that and can't wait to get back on the course. But the reality is right now, golf courses are places where people congregate just as part of a multiplayer game. It inherently creates congregation. And so we've had to make that difficult decision, disc golf courses as well. So I know that that's difficult for people um, and we're getting some feedback on that. But I would say, you know, that's why this concept of how do you get outside to get a little bit of exercise without congregating is the priority. The other thing we would say in it is to try to encourage people to stay near their own locations. So when we talked about getting outside and recreating a lot of early on, what we were seeing is a lot of people coming from more urban markets out into these rural markets. People were getting stuck, their car stuck in the mud, hiking on mountains, like not totally not prepared and having to have, you know, IFNW come in for help. So, you know, we would encourage people to stay local, right? The goal of this is stay near where you're, stay near your home, even when you recreate to, to help reduce the spread of the virus. Well, the closure of golf courses is a, is a blessing for me personally, because I would not want to subject my own golf game on the rest of the state. Uh, we, do, we do have a, 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 some more questions about sure. testing uh, and, and as we start moving back to hopefully uh, being able to be around more people, uh, being able to have more customers in stores, uh, and, and we talked a little bit earlier about the need for widespread testing. Is it envisioned that we might have sort of mass and frequent testings that you know, as people uh, go into the store or, or, you know, you test somebody one day, are they still safe the next day? And what, is, what does that really look like practically, that kind of testing that helps get us uh, hopefully back up and running? And we don't fully know because we don't know, you know, there's so many different tests that are in the pipeline being developed. So we don't know. And, and a lot of times the rapid tests are not as sensitive and specific <clears throat> um, as, they have a lot, in other words, they have a fair amount of false negatives and false positives, not always, but sometimes. So you want tests that are accurate, but then as you said, like as you implied at least that, you know, you could test somebody that could be negative one day and positive a few hours 
you know, a few hours later. So you have to be careful and figure out what is the purpose of testing. So the main purpose um, right now with limited supplies is really to figure out if, if, uh, if, if treatment would be different because of the test results, then you want to test that person. Now, there isn't any treatment really. So it's mostly people whom you think, okay, they're very high risk and we might hospitalize them. So for instance, in at Maine Medical Center, we have people who are in our emergency room who are fairly ill and they have quite a few risk factors. If the test is positive, you might really, you know, have a very low threshold for admitting them because you know they might get sicker. <clears throat> so we want to know what the test result is. Also, um, in congregate settings, long-term care facilities, homeless shelters, correctional facilities, you want to know if somebody's got symptoms, um, if they're, you want to know if they're positive or not, because you're going to treat that, you may not treat that person so much differently, but you have a public health setting, <clears throat> an outbreak, now that you want to treat the outbreak. So as we move down the line and we hopefully start going back to somewhat normalcy, um, then and as, as tests become more prevalent, um, then you want to be able to test people who are symptomatic to see if, uh, if they have the infection because you want to isolate them. So as things loosen up and we get more testing, you wanna, we want to spend a lot more resources on testing people who might be infected because you want to isolate them and do what's called contact tracing, um, get in contact with anybody they've been in close contact over the prior 14 days or so and make sure that they're appropriately isolated. Um, healthcare workers we're testing now if they have symptoms, you want to you know, do more testing to make sure they're not exposing anybody. Um, so we hope to have more testing, um, a lot more testing available in the coming weeks. And, but it's mostly right now, um, you know, envisioning testing people with symptoms, although because we know there's a lot of pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread of this virus, which was not anticipated a few weeks ago, you might end up getting, you know, into the business of testing more people um, who might've been exposed um, just to make sure that they're not exposing others. Um, so it's a little bit we don't know exactly what the future is going to be, but generally speaking, you want to test people who are symptomatic so you can get them isolated as soon as possible, especially as we come out of isolation. We're all isolated right now, but as we start opening up businesses and start getting more, less isolated, you want to make sure to target those who may be symptomatic um, or in the pre-symptomatic stages, if you can identify that and get them isolated um, so that you know, be much more surgical, much more targeted in our efforts um, so that we can continue to open up schools and businesses and the like. Um, but that still means some people will have to be isolated during the times that they may be infectious. Great, thank you. We have only a few minutes left in our program. A couple of quick questions for Commissioner Johnson. Although one, one of my theories is that as our hair gets worse and, and longer, uh, that will be the primary driver of when we have to come out of social isolation. Uh, question uh, for Commissioner uh, Johnson. Uh, heard from uh, the real estate industry uh, that, uh, as well as people who are trying to do their wills and, and trusts, one of the requirements is they have to have a manual execution of a signature. They need to have uh, an, an actual notarization <laughs> in person uh, and people have been inquiring about whether some of those restrictions might get relaxed. Any, any word of, of uh, information on that? So I, there, there is a group that is reviewing, the, reviewing that process to see what, what is safe. Um, so safe from a health perspective, but also safe from a security and legal perspective um, and finding that middle ground. Um, and so that is where work ongoing that I, you know, some of this is evolving as we speak. And, and while it's not ready right this minute, maybe ready even, you know, there may be updates even as, as soon as later today or tomorrow. So I would say check back on that one. It's not, there's nothing final on that. There's no final decision, but certainly it's rec a recognized challenge. Great. And, and last question, uh, as, as part of our effort, not only to socially distance, we've had restrictions on international travel and the Canadian border. Uh, for the moment has been closed. That has an obvious impact on the transaction of, of business. Uh, any information about uh, how the decision might get made to open that, to relax uh, some of the transfer of business activity across border? 
Yeah, so some commercial goods are still able to move cross-border, um, but it's limited. And I think to Dr. Mill's point, you start to get to these public health places where you can loosen certain certain um, elements um, to, to allow for them. I think we haven't identified what all of those metrics are for each individual um, layer of protection that we've put in. So that work kind of is starting now to figure out when, when would that be safe? How would that be safe? Um, and, and so as, as there's more there, I think we can, we can talk about that. Those decisions are really difficult ones that I think nobody takes lightly, right? This balance of, you know, obviously public health is the priority, but recognizing kind of the food supply chain and commercial and commerce supply chains that need to happen um, and, and finding that balance is one that nobody takes lightly. Um, and I think we are, is a constant evolution to, to try to find that right balance. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson, uh, Dr. Mills and, and Dr. Shaw as well. We can't thank you enough for spending time with us this morning. We really appreciate it. I know I and uh, all of our audience learned a lot of information. Thank you so much for the work that you've been putting in. Uh, to, to help us stay safe and keep, keep things moving as much as possible. So with that, uh, we will be concluding our first virtual Eggs and Issues. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank before, you. Before we sign off for however, please know that in these difficult times, the Portland Regional Chamber has been working overtime to keep pace with the many changes that are happening on the COVID-19 front in Greater Portland, in Augusta, and in Washington. Our goal is to keep the economy going and to help our members. Oh, I guess we've got, uh, hold on one second. One of the technical difficulties of, uh, of, being, of being live is uh, when your screen suddenly disappears. Uh, but please know that the, that the Portland Regional Chamber is working very hard to keep everyone informed. Uh, events like today's Eggs and Issues with a record level of attendance I think demonstrates that uh, people really do want to know what's going on. We're going to keep working to uh, advocate here in, in Greater Portland, in Augusta, and in Washington to help all of our, our businesses get through this. Uh, and please know that on the Chamber's website, we are maintaining a, a, a special page for COVID-19, resources for individuals and businesses. And so with that, I will say thank you. Uh, please get out there, enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully we'll be seeing you again on May 13th for our next Eggs and Issues. So thank you so much and have a great day.